first day of Christmas my true love gave to me. The Partridge or Consequences An original short story by Charlie C. C. Thomas Once upon a time, in a land far away and forgotten by all who still draw breath, there was a town without neighbor or friend, and whose residents had long forgotten how they came to be there. But they were happy to be there, for they had their own customs and ways, their own times and celebrations, and their own trials and dangers which kept them locked in the borders of their little town. Mostly. Now, at the edge of the northern wood, marking the northern boundary, there stood Cunning Hill, and atop it was Cunningham Manor, and therein lived the Cunninghams themselves, the richest family in recorded history, however scant those records were. And amongst the lavish holes, garnished in hand-painted murals of beast and maiden alike, there played a boy of eleven, named Ezra Cunningham. He dashed past the velvet curtains after his two black cats, ignoring the potted plant as it teetered on the little table against the wall. He ignored the sound of it breaking on the floor as he rounded the corner and bounded down the great stairs after his friends, bare feet pounding the old dark wood and ornate rug which he never cared to look at. His black curls flew behind him as he picked up as much speed as his young legs would give him, galloping down the main hall and darting into the kitchens as the cats dove for safety. He grinned and wove between the staff, crouching behind the tables uh, to keep from the cook's eye as he scanned the floor for little paws. Then they came, padding quietly through the cellar door past an exiting servant. He grinned crookedly, tongue poking between the gaps in his teeth, and crawled under the tables, pushing the crates and baskets of food out of his way and spilling them onto the floor with great cries from the staff as they swatted him with their towels and kicked him in the behind. He only laughed, rising to hand and foot and scuttling like an ape around the legs of the tables until he found the door. Lord Ezra! The cook shouted, and Ezra stopped. Smile gone as he looked over his shoulder for her round, freckled face and burning eyes. She stalked up to him around the tables, shoving the staff out of her way, apron and skirts flying around her with each great swoosh of her legs. But then he found the corners of her mouth quivering like they always did when she was angry, the twitch in her left eye, the vein in her forehead, and his grin came back with a laugh. He bounded through the door and took the stone spiral stair to the cellar, stopping at the foot and grabbing a candle left on a shelf in the wall and lighting it with a striker. He held the light up to the vast underground expanse, walls of brick and columns jutting up every eight feet with connecting arches overhead. He grinned eyes flicking between the shelves of bottled wine and going right along the wall to peer down the aisle after aisle of bottles, growing into harsher spirits the further that he went, everywhere a perfect hiding place for a cat. He shivered in the cool, dry air, his other hand going into his trousers' pocket as he slowed to keep the flame alight. He stopped at two distant pairs of lights, one set yellow, the other green. He smiled and took a step, creeping between the bottles of whiskey as the reflective eyes sat motionless. Then the cook huffed and heaved, stomping down the steps and beating a trail after Ezra's candle. The eyes disappeared with a pitter-patter of paws. Ezra sighed and chased them, looking over his shoulder to make sure the cook wasn't close behind and running deeper into the darkness until he passed rows of cheeses and cured meats hung from hooks. The cook huffed behind him, calling out and wheezing, but she would not stop till he had him, he knew. And it made him smile, all the wider. Her frustration only made him chuckle 
as he turned a corner and found himself surrounded by aisles of giant wine barrels. He looked back the way he'd come and smirked, setting the candle in the middle of the floor in front of an aisle and padding bare feet into the shadow. You've made a mess of my kitties again, boy! She shouted, stomping into the candlelight and looking down at the flame as he backed away into the dark, hands behind him to feel when he hit the end of the path. Those cats have shed more hair in my food than a mangy dog! I'll not have it! She growled, stooping to lift the candle and swiveling round. He stopped, smirked, and shot forward to run past her back the way that he'd come. He made it just past the wine barrel at the entrance, made it two steps past the cook, barked a laugh in victory, and choked on his own shirt collar. His feet flung out in front of him as the rest was pulled back, his dirty, tattered white shirt gnarled in the cook's fist as she glowered down, her hair almost red in the light. Ezra thrashed and kicked, his smile now a snarl, but she didn't let go. She just dragged him back through the cellar and kitchens, to the hall outside, shouting like a general for one of the servants. A man in simple black dress and white shirt came bounding from around a corner and nodded his head to the cook, fixing his gloves. How can I help you? Take this to its father and explain it's been running its cats through my kitchens again. The cook glared down at Ezra with disgust and shook him slightly as she pushed him forward for the butler to take hold of his shoulders. I'm sure there should be plenty of mess running house now if he's been chasing those things again. Might want to send the maids out for another go at tidying. The butler sighed with a tired smile and nodded. Will do. Thank you. And they both turned away from one another. Ezra dragged by the arm through the manor and up two flights of stairs, struggling and grunting against the butler's cold iron grip. Then Ezra's fire died when he saw the paintings of his ancestors, one family portrait after another the final his own, opposite a pair of ornate carved wooden doors. His father's study. Ezra slumped as they came to the doors. You don't really have to take me to my father, do you? Ezra asked. The resistance gone as he stared at the carving, a man's face with antlers poking through branches and leaves at the center of both doors. It was just a bit of fun. Ezra, the butler said bending with both shoulders and hand. Firm, but not like shackles. You must learn there are always consequences. You can't just destroy the house because you want to have a bit of fun. Fun at the expense of others is only the makings of cruelty. You're only saying that because I'm a boy. Ezra turned his head back to the door, pouting until he found the eyes of the carved faces, almost watching him. We grown-ups are not so different. The butler smiled sadly and sighed, standing and turning to the door with a light rap. Ezra looked up and furrowed his brow at the golden glint between the neck of his glove and shirt cuff. Then his arm was down at his side as he stared at the door, whispering, Trust me. The right door opened, and Ezra's mother stood in the way, fixing a stray strand of black hair behind her ears. She smiled warmly, with raised eyebrows, as the butler gave a subtle bow. Pardon me, Mrs. Cunningham, but your son seems to have mistaken the halls for a place of play. Again. She sighed, deflating as she nodded her head and motioned them both in, her evening dress swaying around her legs. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Have the maids been sent to clean up his mess? They shall as soon as I depart, the butler said, softly but sure ushering Ezra in beside him. Good. And would you send for someone to take this platter back to the kitchens? Tell Mrs. John's luncheon was delicious, as always. She smiled sweetly at the butler, but her eyes were heavy as she took Ezra by his other arm and pulled him across the room into the chair opposite his father, writing at his desk. Ezra stirred wide-eyed, sitting on his hands as daylight streamed in from the massive window behind his father. He stared at the dark wood desk, made from trees that used to grow on the hill their home stood on, trying to see what his father was writing as his mother excused the butler and shut the door. Now, 
What has our son done this time, Helena, my sweet? His father said, still writing. His voice wasn't loud or angry, just his voice. Calm, steady, precise. It made Ezra squirm in the leather-back chair, the third replacement that year, thanks to his cat. His mother came around to the side of the desk, her face long, tired, and pale as she crossed slender arms over her bosom and said, Chasing cats again, was it? Ezra flicked between both of them until his father spoke. Well, Ezra, your mother asked a question. Yes, he said quickly. I I'm sorry, I know I shouldn't, but I got carried away. His father held up a hand and set the pen down, sitting upright and examining Ezra. His bright blue eyes shone in the light, pale face almost white from it, but his hair seemed to drink it into black, nightish locks, slicked back to curl at his nape. He sighed. Did you find them at least? He asked. Ezra shook his head, and his father's eyes grew heavy. Where were they? The cellar. The cellar? His mother almost shrieked. Her heavy eyes wide and dark like coal before flame. How many times must we tell you there are so few places you are not to roam without us? The cellar, the garden, the stables, why? She sighed rubbing her eyes to pinch the bridge of her nose as the other arm fell. Why did you go into the cellar? She asked with controlled aggravation. Tooth and Claw went into the kitchens. Ezra began, eyes falling from his mother to his father's steady expression as he watched his son. Ezra flicked away, through the window and the garden below, down to the desk, his knees, anywhere but his father's eyes. I've followed them. I didn't want them to ruin supper. Don't lie, his father said, voice clear and sharp, but still calm. Tell me the truth. It's better to face one's mistakes and change them than lie to my face while they yet stand at your back. Ezra swallowed and nodded. I was just... having fun. They did go into the kitchens. I did chase them to catch them, but only for the game. Then they went into the cellar and I... It was just supposed to be a game. With that, his parents waited for more, and when none came, his mother closed the distance to his father and kissed his cheek, squeezing his hand as she spoke. I'll go and help find the dreadful things before they get into something down there. Of course, dear, he said with a smile, kissing her once more before they parted and his gaze fell back onto Ezra. Oh, and Cyrus? His mother said from the door, though Ezra didn't dare turn away from his father. Make sure to deal with your son properly. He smirked at her, but his eyes were still sharp as she left and shut the door. Then they fell back on Ezra, not softening per se, but lighter. Fingers laced at his mouth before he decided against it and sat back into his chair. Do you understand why you can't run through the house, even to have fun? Why those cats of yours cannot remain wild if they're to stay here? Ezra sighed and sat back into his own chair, hands coming up to his lap to pick under his nails. Because I make a mess. What was that? I make a mess, Ezra said clearer, careful not to sound bitter. No. You're not allowed to run around the house for fun, for the same reason your sister isn't allowed to either. Nor myself, nor your mother, or any of the staff. Nor the servants, for that matter. The operations of this house must be maintained, or there will be dire consequences for us all. Not just us, you understand, or the house, but the town. Ezra furrowed his brow and met his father's pale eyes with his own. I have yet to tell you everything, and I shan't explain to you now, for you're too young to understand, but please remember that our family holds great importance. Our duty is an important one for the town's peace, and we cannot ensure that unless our house operates in order. But how can playing in the halls keep the house from running well? It's just a game. Ezra's father looked him over, eyes not hard or sharp, but deep. Then he motioned Ezra around the desk. Come, 
and they moved in front of the window, looking down on the garden. What we do may look small, no smaller than the seed of a pear, but given enough time that seed becomes a tree, just like that one in the center. He pointed to the old pear tree in the middle of the garden, surrounded by a grassy lawn with trimmed rings of flowers lining the paths, shadows starting to come long as the sun set over his mother's handiwork. But it's just a game, Ezra repeated. The tree's just a happy tree. He tried for a small laugh, but his father only sighed through his nostrils. Suppose Tooth jumped into the kitchens and knocked something into breakfast, so that we couldn't eat until luncheon. How do you think that would affect us and how we run the manor? I may write something poorly worded to the other houses and stir bad relations, making the town rife with enmity. Your mother may accidentally kill a plant she's worked hard to cultivate and fall into one of her dark fits, leaving us to tend to her until she was well, and pulling us away from our duties. Then he smirked with a small chuckle and said lightly, the cook may well become so angry that she throws her hands down and slings a knife straight into her neck and dies on the kitchen floor. And then we'll never have luncheon either. Ezra smiled despite himself, fighting a chuckle as his father looked down expectantly. Face still light, but his eyes were serious. Ezra looked away to the garden and the little creatures his mother nurtured inside, following a pair of white rabbits as they bounded across the lawn to their burrow and the young fawn peeking from behind the pear tree at the large partridge. It bobbed its head and spread its wings, a huge specimen the size of a pea hen. I'm sorry, father, but all that wouldn't happen just because we missed breakfast, surely. His father shrugged and set his hand on Ezra's back, directing his gaze around the garden with his fingers, the stone pillars and arches with an iron fence between each to keep his mother's pets in. The bright green and vibrant flowers against the pale stone and scurrying things, a doe come up from the pond, a beehive she'd just built, the wooden homes for her vipers and, of course, her father's recent gift of the partridge itself. Your mother doesn't only nurse the gentle creatures of the wood, you know. That's why you're never to play in the garden, lest you're struck by a serpent. But what of tooth or claw? were to climb through the bars. They couldn't make much mess, surely. Everything else is pretty fast. They shouldn't catch anything. Ezra smiled at the thought of his yellow and green-eyed friends making mayhem in the wide green court in the center of the manor. They might never want to leave. There's so many places for a cat to hide. They could be wild again and Mother would have to tend to them. Ezra chuckled. She wouldn't like that, would she? He looked up and his father afforded him a small smile before he gripped Ezra's shoulder and held his eye with a not unkind face. No, she wouldn't. But even worse, what if they were struck by a serpent? Ezra's grin fell as he imagined them dead and foaming at the mouth, convulsing as a snake unhinged its jaw to swallow tooth and claw whole. What if they were to crawl into the ovens unseen and be cooked alongside supper? Ezra's eyes watered as he saw them clawing at the inside of an oven, screaming, begging for their lives as their fur caught fire and blackened and boiled and fell dead, unheard for the bustle of the kitchens. What if they flee the house to the northward and are set upon by beasts, shall we say? Ezra slumped wet eyes drifting to the pear tree and the sparkling partridge roosting in the lowest branch, trying to ignore the image of the cats skinned, their bowels opened and spread over the forest floor. You're their master, Ezra, and you must do right and tame the wild out of them as best you can. A beast will be a beast, but I don't want to see them suffer, nor you, especially you if something were to come upon them. You are heir to the Cunningham Manor, and all its legacies and responsibilities, so do this for me. Master your beloved cats, and prove to me that you can set upon the path to take charge of our house one day." His father knelt, 
and turned Ezra to face him. But they're just cats. That doesn't prepare me for anything. Ezra's face was hot as he balled up his hands and looked away from his father's softening, smiling eyes. Then his father laughed, gently pulling Ezra's chin to look at him again. Try to tame a cat and tell me that it is easy, son, and I will call you a liar. Ezra grinned, despite himself, with a small nod before his father continued. But remember, even a small seed can become a pear tree, and one may never know how many forests could grow from the seeds of a single tree if you cultivated long enough. Ezra blinked and furrowed his brows. I think I understand. His father brushed Ezra's long curls aside and kissed the top of his head with a smile wrinkling his eyes as his hand rested on his nape. We'll see, my Ezra. We'll see. But remember, do this, and not only because I've told you, but because you must. You're soon to become a man, and a man must know how to put things in order, especially himself. For everyone? His father nodded with an understanding sigh. That's... a lot of people, father. It is. But we'll start you out with just the two cats for now, yes? Ezra smiled with a little nod. Right. Now go on and help your mother find tooth and claw so you can get started. Yes, father. He nodded and made his way across the study, glossing over the books coloring the walls deep red, brown, and purple. And be sure to clean and dress yourself shortly. Supper will be had early tonight. Your mother and I have business to attend. But as the hours ticked by, Tooth and Claw were nowhere to be found. Ezra looked for hours on hours, even to the annoyance of the staff, but finally had to stop to make himself ready for supper. Thereafter, he asked if he could continue searching and was given one hour, but he still couldn't find them. So he went to bed, worry twisting his stomach too much to even think of playing with his soldiers or read his books. He lay there under his blankets, chewing his lip and kneading the sheets as his eyes flitted back and forth at his father's challenge. He tossed side to side, wondering of ways to tame his friends and prove himself. His guts sank with a cold realization that they were no different than when they'd first come, or were worse. He treated them as friends, and not as the animals they were. But when they came to him behind his eyes, dead in the garden, or the oven, or the northern woods. His eyes still watered. And he sighed, pulling the covers over his shoulders, as he saw the rabbits and squirrels and voles in his mother's garden with tooth and claw chasing them down and sinking their fangs into them. Mother would feel the same, wouldn't she? He asked himself, and sighed when he knew the answer. Worse even, because they were all gifts from father. He rolled onto his back with a determined face, glaring up at the ceiling and a stubborn nod before he flicked to the window and the firelight outside. He furrowed his brow and crawled out of bed to peek through the glass as two people walked in cloaks along the trail between the manor and Swan Lake, heading for the northern wood. They stopped as they approached the tree line and looked at the manor the man turning aside so a third person, a small woman twinkling in the firelight, could stare. She wiped her eyes, gave a nod, and then they continued on. And Ezra sat by his window, watching for them to return. But that night, all he watched with the backs of his eyelids as the sun warmed his face and a scream cut the calm air. He jolted up, looking round and wincing at the pain in his neck and shoulders from slouching against the wall all night long. Then came a second scream, a woman from somewhere in the open. He opened his window and looked round, but there was nothing. He turned round, flinging through his door and running into the hall in his nightgown. He bolted for his parents' chambers, but the door was already open and the room empty, bed neatly made, so he spun on his heels and dashed for the stairs. He had to weave between the staff as they rushed round, rubbing their eyes and trying to tie their robes. Ezra bounded between them like his cats, following the screams to the garden as his heart sank with every step closer. He pushed through the doors to the alcove walkway, encircling the garden, 
racing along the iron fence until he found the gate and barged in ahead of the staff, slamming it shut behind him. He ran through the manicured lawn, leaping over the short flower bushes for the pear tree a ways off. A woman, his mother, stood in front of it in her gardening attire, shirt close and tucked into her trousers, with a man in his mourning robe beside her. She deflated, with a gloved hand covering her face as she said something low and gestured to something on the ground. Tears welled in Ezra's eyes as he galloped for the tree. The image of tooth and claw dead in the grass, from a viper or maybe a fox that had snuck in, or some hawk that had dove down to feast on their innards. And the tears fell down his cheeks as he reached his parents, panting and scanning the ground for their bodies, cursing himself that he hadn't even had the chance to tame them yet. But they weren't dead. His mother, draping like a willow, jerked with sudden energy out of her husband's arms and flung her booted feet at something to the right. Ezra followed, relief spreading out through his limbs as tooth and claw both scrambled back from his mother's jab and circled around one another to sit at the base of the tree licking blood from their lips as yellow and green eyes stared in bored confusion up at them all. And as others gathered round them, his sister, his unwed uncle, the staff and servants, Ezra's eyes fell on the dark puddle of blood, fed by a slow drip from the branches above. He looked up and froze, his mother's voice distant and muffled as he stared at the partridge. It hung in the tree from a crook in a branch where its foot was caught, the other leg bent wrong, its breast punctured and bloody, its wings broken and bent. Ezra blinked, and everything returned to normal pace, his heart racing as his eyes flicked to sift through one idea after another. Then he found his father's face, stern but not cruel, and Ezra set his jaw. He took his mother's gloved hand and stood in front of her, tears welling in his eyes as he said the words he knew he should say. Mother, I'm sorry. I'll make this right. And when he found her face, her red eyes lost their fire, furrowing in confusion before she knelt and squeezed his hands, still fighting back her aggravation. My Ezra, what could you do? Your father's gift is dead. There is no other bird like it in these woods. It was irreplaceable. I can never hope to return the partridge to you, but I will ensure this never happens again. Then Ezra found his father's face, and stood tall, more than a boy, and said past the tears, I know there's a way to make flesh sleep and stitch it as you would to your will, father. Ezra's father furrowed his brow, hand still on his wife's shoulder as everyone stared at him. There is. But how come you to know this? Ezra looked out into the small sea of staff and servants, some covering their heads and faces with shawls and others a queer color in the early light. He stopped on the butler, who'd led him to his father's study, and the servant gave a sad grin and nodded his head, gesturing him on. Then Ezra came back to his father and continued, I'm not so disinterested in what you would teach me as you might think. He would have smirked if not for the graveness of the air. I don't know how to do it, nor do I care, but a man sets things in order. And I would have this done if I cannot do it myself. Take tooth and claw and make them to sleep until called upon as others have done before us. His father raised his eyebrows and stepped forward, the free hand finding Ezra's shoulder and sliding up to hold the side of his face. Are you certain? This isn't a small thing you propose, son. Better I do a hard thing and save my heart from breaking, than be simple and shattered. Ezra's parents grinned and found each other's eyes with a nod before his mother spoke, his father dropping his hand. Your father's right. This will not be easy, my Ezra, but you will not be alone. We shall make a right of this wrong, together. I'm sorry I cannot return your partridge, mother. She took his face in her hands and moved to kiss him, but stopped and smirked, instead wiping the tears away. Better a bird than you. Ezra turned to the crowd of staff, 
and then tooth and claw, still cleaning the blood from their fur. Would it be out of place for me to order them held? Ezra asked. Not today, his father replied, and motioned for the servants to come after the cats and his mother rose, both of their faces falling graver as they looked to the north. Now come, my son. What we will require waits in the wood. His mother took the bird by its leg and called for a bowl. Get dressed, Ezra. Today the house of Cunningham shall have another man in its number, for you're to meet the king of the woods folk. A partridge in a pear tree.